Hello, and welcome to this presentation, Understanding GPIB. In this presentation, we'll provide a short technical introduction to GPIB and explain how GPIB is used for automation of test and measurement instruments. Most modern test and measurement instruments are controlled using standardized Skippy commands sent over GPIB or other interfaces, such as Ethernet or USB. We'll discuss Skippy only very briefly near the end of this presentation. So please see the separate presentation, Understanding Skippy, for a more detailed explanation of Skippy commands and how they're used. Remote control or automation of test and measurement instruments, such as spectrum analyzers or oscilloscopes, is widely used because it provides numerous advantages, such as unattended operation, faster and more repeatable measurements, synchronization between multiple instruments and other devices, etc. In most cases, a single PC acts as a controller that controls one or more instruments by issuing commands and receiving results or data. In the early days of electronic test and measurement, this remote control was often carried out using non-standard or proprietary cables, connectors, interfaces, and messages. The first standardized interface for test and measurement instruments was something called GPIB. GPIB stands for General Purpose Interface Bus, but you'll also see this sometimes referred to as IEEE 488. As mentioned a moment ago, GPIB is a standard for interconnecting test and measurement instruments, and it's defined on a very fundamental physical and electrical level. However, GPIB was designed to be vendor or manufacturer neutral. That is, it was intended to allow for the interconnection of devices from different manufacturers. In addition to the physical and electrical characteristics, GPIB also defines protocols or procedures to establish basic communication between a sender or talker and a receiver or listener. It also includes a handshake procedure for synchronizing data transfer. Note that GPIB does not specify the content or the meaning of data bytes sent over it. We'll come back to this point later in this presentation. GPIB transfers data over a shared bus with a maximum length of 20 meters and no more than 2 meters, on average, between devices. Up to 15 devices can be on a single GPIB bus, one of which acts as the controller. The maximum transfer speed on a GPIB bus is nominally 1 megabit per second, but modern implementations can sometimes support higher speeds. As we'll discuss later in this presentation, maximum data transfer is however limited by the slowest listener on the bus. A GPIB bus is managed by a controller. This node controls the interactions between devices on the bus and also sends special interface commands. Historically, the controller was most often implemented as a card installed into a PC, but USB to GPIB adapters are common in more recent applications. There can only be one active controller on the bus at a time. GPIB does provide a procedure for a controller to pass control to another device, but this is uncommon. As for the test and measurement instruments themselves, these usually have a built-in GPIB interface on the rear of the device. Note that this port may be labeled IEEE 488. Instruments on a GPIB bus can operate either as a listener that only receives commands, but in most cases they are talkers that can either send or receive data. Devices must be manually configured before being placed on a GPIB bus. This configuration consists primarily of an address, which allows the controller or talker to communicate with or control a specific device. And therefore, each device on the bus must have a unique address. Although only 15 devices may be on a GPIB bus, the address range is 0 through 31 with zero often being reserved for the controller. On modern instruments, addresses are normally set up through the user interface, as shown here. For older instruments, dip switches or jumpers may be used to set the address in binary form. In some cases, it may also be necessary to configure whether a special character and or a special control line is used to terminate transmitted data. 
GPIB is a multi-wire bus. Specifically, the bus consists of 24 wires, 16 of which are active, and 8 of which are ground. Note that some of these ground wires are paired with certain active wires. The active wires are divided into three separate groups based on their purpose or function. Bus management consists of five lines. The handshaking procedure uses three lines, and eight lines are used for data transfer. GPIB uses standard TTL voltage levels, but uses negative or inverted logic. That is, a low physical voltage corresponds to asserted, true, or a logical one. GPIB connectors, therefore, also have 24 pins. Instruments or devices have female receptacles, and the cables used to connect devices must have male receptacles. In practice, many GPIB cables have connectors with both male and female receptacles on each end. This makes it easy to daisy chain or stack connectors. We'll look at this on the next slide. They also often have lock screws for stability. GPIB cables tend to be rather thick, inflexible, and heavy. This is partly due to the shielding used to prevent data corruption. And as mentioned on the last slide, numerous lines are implemented as single ground combinations in the form of twisted pairs, further adding to the cable's bulk. Using these types of cables, there are two general methods for connecting multiple devices to a GPIB bus. One is daisy chaining. Here, the cable originates at the controller, and each additional instrument is connected sequentially from the previous instrument. Another method is called stacking, or a star arrangement. In this method, the cables are stacked using the dual gender connectors on the end of standard GPIB cables. Note that it's possible to combine these topologies, that is, both daisy chaining and stacking, can be used together in the same GPIB bus. Next, let's take a look at some of the more important concepts in GPIB. These are bus management, local and remote operation, polling, handshaking, interface messages, and device-dependent messages. We'll only provide a general introduction to each of these concepts, so please see the GPIB specification if you'd like more detailed information on these or other topics. Let's start with bus management. Recall that five of the active lines are used for managing the GPIB bus. The ATN or attention line is used to address devices and is also used for indicating whether the data lines contain control information or data. REN selects local or remote device control, and SRQ is used by devices that wish to interrupt activity and request service. We'll cover both of these topics in more detail on the next slides. The EOI line is one of the ways of indicating the end of a multibyte message, another topic we'll come back to in a few moments. And finally, interface clear can be used to reset the interface of every device on the bus, and thus return the bus to a known stable state. When instruments are being controlled remotely, they normally enter a remote state in which the controller has exclusive access over the instrument. That is, local control of the instrument is not possible via the front panel or user interface. Remote mode is intended to prevent problems that might arise from local users making changes during remote operation. The screen may also be locked and display an indication that the instrument is under remote control. Asserting the REN line places an addressed instrument in remote mode, and the most common ways of exiting remote mode are either by unasserting REN or by pressing a special local button on the front of the instrument itself. Another important aspect of GPIB is polling. A device on a GPIB bus that wishes to inform the controller about events, error conditions, etc., can request service at any time by asserting the SRQ line. Like all GPIB lines, SRQ is a shared line, and therefore the controller has to use a procedure called polling to determine which device is generating this interrupt. In the vast majority of cases, devices are polled one after another using something called serial polling. GPIB does support a parallel poll, but this is rather uncommon. When polled, each device returns its status byte on the data lines. 
A bit within each device's status byte indicates if it's the device requesting service. And the other bytes are used to convey information about the nature of the request or the state of the poll device. Once its status byte has been read, the device requesting service then unasserts SRQ. One important thing to remember is that it's also possible for the controller to periodically poll the status byte even if SRQ is not asserted, and this is commonly done in many test automation scenarios. Handshaking is an important part of GPIB. It ensures a reliable transfer of messages and limits the data transfer speed to the speed supported by the slowest listener. This handshake is performed for every byte transferred over the GPIB bus. Three GPIB lines are used for handshaking. Data valid is pulled low, or asserted, by a talker to indicate that a new data byte has been placed on the data lines and is ready to be read. An RFD, or not ready for data, is set high or unasserted by listeners to show that they are ready to accept a new data byte. And NDAC, or not data accepted, is unasserted by each listener after it has read the data. Let's walk through this handshaking process graphically. The talker first places the data on the data lines and then verifies that an RFD is unasserted and NDAC is asserted. This combination means that all devices are ready to receive data. When this is true, the talker asserts DAV to indicate that new data is ready. All listeners assert an RFD to indicate that they are starting to read the data. As each listener completes reading the data, it unasserts NDAC. After all listeners have unasserted NDAC, the shared NDAC line becomes unasserted. Upon seeing this, the talker unasserts DAV and removes the data from the data lines, since all listeners have now indicated that they have received the data. Note that this part of the handshake is what limits the speed of a GPIB bus to the speed of the slowest listener. All the listeners then assert NDAC. At this point, even though all the listeners have acknowledged receipt of the data, the GPIB protocol requires an explicit signal to show that each device is ready to receive the next data byte. This is done by each device unasserting an RFD. As with NDAC, the NRFD line only becomes unasserted after all devices have unasserted it. After this, the bus returns to the state shown at the beginning of this example with NRFD unasserted and NDAC asserted, and the process can be repeated. As the name implies, interface messages are used to manage the GPIB interface itself, rather than the attached device. And for the most part, these messages are transparent to the user. That is, they're not explicitly coded or controlled by test automation. These messages are transmitted on the data lines with the ATN line asserted to indicate that these are interface messages. Interface messages fall into two categories. One is universal commands. These commands affect all instruments and therefore do not require addressing. Examples are commands for clearing or resetting devices or commands that are used in the polling we discussed earlier. The other type of command is addressed commands, which only affect a specific address device. Examples of addressed commands include toggling between local and remote modes and triggering measurements. There are numerous interface commands of each type, so please see the GPIB specification for more information about interface commands and how they're used. As opposed to interface messages, which control the GPIB interface, device-dependent messages control the device or instrument itself. These are created and sent by the test automation user and are not defined as part of the GPIB specification. After talker and listeners are addressed, the controller unasserts ATN to indicate that device-dependent messages are being sent over the data lines. In most cases, these are multi-byte messages, which are terminated either using the special EOI signal mentioned earlier, or by using special termination characters. In most modern implementations, 
These device-dependent messages are based on the so-called Skippy standard. The IEEE 488.1 standard defined the GPIB interface, that is, things like hardware, handshaking, interface messages, etc. However, test automation is based on sending the device-dependent messages that we just mentioned. For example, we might want the controller to send the message set output frequency to 919 MHz to a signal generator, and GPIB does not specifically define how this is done. A later related specification, IEEE 488.2, was developed to define the protocols for exchanging these messages, and includes things such as formats, status reporting, housekeeping commands, etc. Skippy, or Standard Commands for Programmable Instruments, is a standard that builds upon IEEE 48.2 and provides a standard structure for device-dependent messages. For example, we would send the signal generator source colon frequency space 919 MHZ. We don't have time to cover Skippy in detail in this presentation, so please see the separate presentation, Understanding Skippy, to learn more about Skippy commands and how they're used in test automation. Although GPIB has been widely used for decades, it has been replaced by USB or Ethernet in many applications. There are several reasons for this, including the smaller size, lighter weight, and lower cost of these technologies compared to GPIB. Using a LAN connection also removes some of the limitations of GPIB in terms of distance and node count. And of course, LAN provides better performance when transferring large amounts of measurement data. Instruments having only a GPIB interface can be connected to an Ethernet-based automation network using special gateways. That said, many current test and measurement instruments still provide a standard or optional GPIB interface, and GPIB is still important for many legacy applications. And finally, a basic understanding of GPIB also provides a good foundation for learning and understanding Skippy-based automation over non-GPIB interfaces as well. Let's end with a brief summary. GPIB, or the General Purpose Interface Bus, was the first standard for remote control of test and measurement instruments, and is often also referred to as IEEE 488. GPIB is implemented using a shared 24-wire bus with negative logic and TTL voltage levels. An important aspect of GPIB is the handshaking procedure that's used to transfer data on a per-byte basis. And this procedure limits the bus speed to the speed of the slowest listener. Two kinds of messages can be sent over GPIB. Interface messages are defined in the GPIB standard and are used to manage the bus and the interfaces themselves. Device-dependent messages are used to configure, control, and obtain information from devices or instruments on the bus. These messages are not defined in the GPIB standard, but rather are normally in the form of so-called Skippy commands and responses. Although interfaces such as Ethernet and USB have been replacing GPIB over the last couple of decades, GPIB is still in wide use, and many modern instruments still provide GPIB as a standard or optional interface. This concludes our presentation, Understanding GPIB. If you'd like to learn more about GPIB, test automation, or test and measurement instruments from Rodian Schwartz, please see the links in the video description. Thanks for watching.